Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Whether you're talking about classical works of fine art, the beauty of the human form, or people's awesome threads. Fashion goes in and out of style constantly. What is considered appealing to one group of people during one period of history may look ridiculous or downright shocking to someone else when taken out of context, as any Victorian time traveler who's ever stumbled into a Guar concert will tell you. Today, we're taking a look at some particularly unusual fashion trends from throughout history. But before we get started, remember to subscribe to the Weird History channel and leave us a comment letting us know what other past trends you would like to hear about. Okay, time to feast your eyes on this historic fit. Clothing obviously has a practical function. It's not like we can all just run around in the nude like wild, untamable horses. Or can we? But fashion, on the other hand, doesn't serve a practical purpose. Fashion is just about looking good and feeling good about looking good. Still, when diving into the stories behind historical fashions, oftentimes there really was a method to their apparent madness. Take, for example, the German mercenaries of the Renaissance period, known as the Landsknechts, who dressed in colorful and mismatched ensembles, like every day was laundry day. At the time, the Holy Roman Empire was not particularly centralized, wealthy, or powerful. Consequently, a lot of the men who would have otherwise fought for the church worked instead as free agents, taking part in the various wars of their age by fighting for whichever side paid the most for their services. In addition to being paid by whatever lord or cause they served, Landsknecht made much of their money via post-battle looting. And because this would often include scraps of clothing and armor from their fallen opponents, their outfits became notably motley collections of various fabrics and materials, all sewn together to create a new, makeshift ensemble, a violent quilt, if you will. These outfits didn't just look distinctive either, but served as a kind of walking billboard for that mercenary's services. After all, if he'd remained alive long enough to secure all of these clothes and accessories and weapons from various fallen enemies, he must be pretty good at fighting. Or very good at thrifting which is no less impressive. The iconic kilts worn by the Highland Scots of the past certainly looked smart with their immediately recognizable tartan patterns, but were primarily designed with practical concerns in mind. Unlike the kilts of today, which are designed purely to be worn around the waist by people with Scottish ancestry and people who list beer as a hobby, classic great kilts, also known as belted plaids, were basically just large woolen blankets that would be worn or draped around the body in a variety of ways. They obviously provided protection from the elements, but also could be used to carry supplies or even children, and could be helpful for concealing personal items or weapons on the go. While marching through water or damp ground, kilts could also be tucked up to prevent them from getting too wet, unlike a more conventional piece of outerwear. When not on the go, a Scotsman kilt could even serve as a blanket for sleeping. The kilts were worn commonly in Scotland until King George II passed the Dress Act of 1746, banning them as a way of suppressing Highland culture. Or he just really hated plaid. Like the kilt, the iconic flapper style of the 1920s was another victory of both fashion and function. Women's fashions in previous years accentuated the hips and breasts, often through the use of tight-fitting corsets that constricted movement and were often painful to wear. More modern women in the 20s, however, were engaged in more physical activities outside of the house, like dancing the Charleston and getting into hijinks with one or more Marx Brothers, and demanded appropriate attire. This led to the popularity of the flapper style, including thin undergarments, generally lighter fabrics, and roomy step-in garments fastened with just a few buttons. Now, here's a trend we can get behind. In Europe during the 15th and 16th centuries, exaggerated codpieces, sewn into trousers to accentuate the crotch, became popular with male aristocrats. Codpieces, of course, already had a role to play on the battlefield where plates or armor shielded the important gonads of wealthy lords from injury. But soon they began appearing in more everyday settings, and even at court. When initially introduced to the home front, these cod pieces were relatively simple and even functional. In an era with fewer options for pockets, cod pieces sometimes served as something of a medieval fanny pack, used for bringing small items along with you for the day. Well, not that small. Speaking of which, the trend rapidly turned competitive, with individuals favoring increasingly larger and more elaborately decorative codpieces. England's King Henry VIII was rumored to own one weighing more than two and a half pounds. Geez, you're gonna have to add in some extra lumber support with that one. 
16th century Europe also witnessed a shift toward more elaborate women's fashions. Whereas outfits were once chosen to make the wearer seem slimmer, a hot new trend went in the opposite direction, adding padding, hoops, and other embellishments to take up more physical space and make the wearer's body seem larger. Material known as bombast, made up of a combination of wool, cotton, horsehair, and sometimes sawdust, was used to achieve this dense, heavy look. Some men also took to adding bombast to their outfits, particularly around the chest and arms. You know, sort of like a Hulk costume. A number of classic portraits of Queen Elizabeth I find her wearing elaborate outfits that exaggerate the size of her frame, particularly her arms and sleeves, while making her head appear comparatively small, like a Dick Tracy villain. Elaborate costumes that exaggerated the size of the body were a common theme throughout the aristocratic and noble courts of Europe for the next few centuries. During the reign of King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette of France, for example, a hairstyling trend known as the pouf sentimentale became all the rage. These were essentially wigs married to large headdresses, many of which featured ceremonial or particularly meaningful objects woven in or nested atop the fake hair. These could include simple items like butterflies, entire model ships, and even crematory urns, you know, for when you want to take your favorite dead ant to the party. Among the first women to popularize the trend was the Duchess of Chartres in April of 1774, who commemorated the birth of her child by having noted stylist Monsieur Léonard create a unique hairstyle featuring 14 yards of gauze around a fake tower which featured wax figures of a nurse holding her son. But that's not all. Her wig also included a parrot pecking at a plate of cherries, a wax figure of a small boy reclining at the nurse's feet, and the initials of the Duchess's husband, father, and father-in-law formed out of pieces of their own hair. Maybe just mail out some Hallmark cards next time? Throughout much of modern European history, powdered wigs remained one of the essential symbols of the ruling class. In the 17th century, two trends combined to make the distinctive curly white wigs de rigueur for French aristocrats and American founding fathers alike. The first was syphilis. Yeah, that old chestnut. Symptoms of the sexually transmitted infection include sores, prematurely gray hair, and hair loss. As there was no cure or even particularly effective treatment at the time, Antibiotics were still way, way off. Many men sought a way to hide their syphilis infections from their peers, and big fancy wigs are always a good distraction. The dominance of powdered wigs was influenced by two European kings, King Louis XIV of France and his cousin, King Charles II of England. Louis started to lose his hair at age 17 and took to wigs as a way to hide his receding hairline. It would not do for the king to be visibly balding at his senior prom. Soon after, Charles started to go prematurely gray. It's pretty likely that both of these guys had syphilis, and that's what was causing their symptoms. But regardless, once kings started wearing wigs, everyone wanted in on the trend. Well, everyone with money, that is. No powdered wigs for the poor. High-heeled shoes are still extremely popular today, but their journey to becoming a modern fashion staple might surprise you. The first high-heeled shoes were fashioned in Persia during the 10th century and were intended to keep the wearer's feet securely locked into stirrups while riding on horseback and look fabulous while doing it. Over centuries, Persian men started to wear the shoes in non-horse-related settings, and eventually they became standard at royal court functions and festive gatherings. Once Europeans started to see Persians wearing high heels at fancy balls, they adopted the trend to themselves, but at this point, the trend was still only for men. King Louis XIV himself preferred to wear high heels paired with tight stockings to make himself appear taller and thus more intimidating on the basketball court. Meanwhile, long, pointy shoes had taken off in Poland during the 14th and 15th centuries instead of being taken off, which is arguably what should have happened. The craze ultimately made its way to Western Europe. The English in particular became fans of the distinctive footwear, which came to be known as Krakow shoes after the Polish city or sometimes Poulains. As with cod pieces, the Poulain scene ultimately became a measuring contest, with aristocrats trying out increasingly long and elaborate pointy shoe designs. In some cases, wearers had to actually tie the points of their shoes to their knees in order to walk around without shattering a hip. But not everyone was a fan. By 1388, the trend had spread widely enough that it became the subject of a satirical poem, suggesting that their long toes made it impossible for the shoe's owners to properly kneel in prayer. Trust us, back then, that was a devastating dunk. 
In 1463, King Edward IV passed an actual law barring anyone below the rank of a lord from wearing shoes with points longer than two inches. In the 21st century, people spend billions each year on their teeth to make them look whiter, cleaner, and more appealing. Or to do some minor repairs after betting they could bite the cap off of a bottle of Miller High Life. However, in ancient Japan, having a smile blacker than a coal chute in winter was considered a good thing. Starting around the beginning of the Kofun era, which lasted from roughly the 4th to the 6th centuries, the custom of uhaguro was common. The practice is shared by a number of Asian and Oceanic cultures, and it involves blackening the teeth with a substance called kanemizu, made up of a combination of iron, vinegar, tannin, and a sprinkle of attitude. There may have been a practical purpose behind the custom. It's believed that tooth blackening during puberty can function like modern dental sealants, protecting tooth enamel and preventing decay. Plus, you can sneak licorice whips all day and no one will be the wiser. But the practice was more about cultural tradition than dentistry, and a number of cultures simply find black teeth to be attractive. In Japanese art and culture, pitch black items are particularly prized and considered especially beautiful. During the Heian period, beginning around the year 800 CE, young people would blacken their teeth around the time they turned 15 to symbolize their passage into adulthood. The practice remained common until the Meiji period, ending around the start of the 20th century, another senseless victim of Big Colgate. So what do you think? Which of these unusual fashion trends would you be willing to try? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, be sure to check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.